Father, pray that you be with her and you bless her, Lord Father, and uh, more importantly, bless her with your presence. Lord Father, we lift up our brother Charlie and just pray, Lord Father, that you um, can uh, strengthen him and bring him back into the, 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 the fold of the, of the uh, uh, community, and that you can encourage him, that you can use people like our brother Frank to, to deliver a message of hope and a reminder that the Lord loves him and that he is missed by, by our church. Lord Father, we, uh, we know that there are many people traveling this summer. Just pray that you be with all the families as they travel. Be, uh, be protective of their, of their travel and just be with them wherever they go. And I uh, lift up my brother Mark that you may be with him. And the Spirit use him and guide him as he brings us the word. That it may be holy and pleasing to you and beneficial for our ears. Lord and Father, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Brother Mark, pulpits are the... The stand's all yours. All right, thank you, Pastor. And I want us to open the Word of God this this evening to John chapter six, as I'm going to be discussing with you one of the most unusual miracles that Jesus performed feeding of the 5,000. But before we get there, I want us to spend just a little bit of time talking about the subject that I think that Brother Irby uh, talked about some last week, and that is what is the purpose of the miracles that Jesus performed. And as I've studied the, the miracles and have thought a lot about the miracles that Jesus performed was really my conclusion that there was one purpose behind every single miracle that Jesus performed. The healing of a blind man wasn't for the purpose of healing of a blind man. The healing of the deaf and the mute was not so that they could hear and speak. The raising of Lazarus was not for the sake of Lazarus. I mean, those were the fruits, amen. That's what came out of all of it, but it wasn't the reason that Jesus performed miracles. And I thought about, as you were reading in John chapter 1 uh, earlier, that that tells us exactly why Jesus performed the miracles. The very words that our pastor read to us. Now I'm going to read them to us again. Where it says of him that he was in the world in verse 10. And though the world was made through him, the world did not what? No. They did not recognize him. They didn't recognize that he was indeed the son of God. That he indeed was God himself in the flesh. They did not recognize him. And then John goes on to say, he came unto his own, he came unto the Israelites. And they did not receive him. They refused to believe his message and his testimony about himself. We wonder, if you wonder why it is that Jesus performed the miracle, it was because of that problem right there. He was neither being recognized nor uh, being received. But you'll notice in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and we're not even getting into John chapter 6 and the miracle yet, but in verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have what? We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, Full of grace and truth. John says the problem was that people did not recognize him and they did not receive him, but he says, But we have seen him. And we know for sure that he is the one who came down from heaven, who came from the Father, and we have seen his glory. And glory belongs only to one, and that is to God. Amen. And John is saying in his personal testimony of what he had seen through all that Jesus had done, 
that we have seen the very glory of God. We have seen the one who indeed is God. And when we think about the miracles that Jesus performed, I, I think I can tell you with absolute biblical certainty that the only reason, the solitary reason Jesus performed every miracle he performed was to give testimony of who he was. It was the way in which God gave accreditation to Jesus. In fact, if you turn over to Acts chapter 2 quickly, Acts chapter 2 where Peter is making his speech at Pentecost, he says these words, Men of Israel, in verse 22 of Acts, Acts chapter 2, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you. By what? By miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. There Peter states it quite plainly, doesn't he? That the reason Jesus performed every miracle, every sign, every wonder that he did was God was accrediting who Jesus was to those who saw him. Those who saw him touch the sick and raise the dead and every miracle that Jesus performed was for this one solitary reason. I'll, I'll repeat again what I said earlier. He didn't raise the dead for the sake of raising the dead. He didn't heal a blind man just so a blind man could see. But rather, it was all testimony of who Jesus was. Now that's important for us to understand, especially when we get to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. Do you realize that of all the miracles that Jesus performed, and Irby, I think you said there's 37 miracles that Jesus performed during his earthly ministry, that there are only two miracles that were centered around the Lord Jesus Christ that are mentioned in every one of the Gospels. All four Gospels certainly sing for us the great song of the resurrection, amen? Amen. The greatest miracle of all, Jesus being raised from the dead. But the only other miracle that every one of the four gospel writers tells us about is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, you see it in John chapter 6, you see it in Matthew chapter 14, you see it in Mark chapter 6, you see it in Luke chapter 9. All four of the gospel writers speak of the great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. In addition, not only do they speak of the feeding of the 5,000, but they also talk about what happened after the feeding of the 5,000, and that's when Jesus had sent his disciples out on a boat to go across the sea. And Jesus, as he was up in a high place by himself praying, a storm came upon that sea, and Jesus did what? He walked out on the water. I'm sure somebody probably offered him a lift on a boat. He said, no, I've got this. <laughs> and he walked out across the sea to rescue his disciples. We, we can't separate those two stories. The gospel writers connect those two stories, and they do so for a good reason. And even before we get into John chapter 6, I want us to think about what Mark chapter 6 has to say. For in Mark chapter 6, the story of the feeding of the 5,000 begins in verse 30, and then in verse 45, the story of Jesus walking on the water. But if you get to verse 51 of Mark chapter 6, and then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down, and they were completely amazed, for they had not understand, understood about, now listen to what he says, they had not understood about the loaves. And their hearts were hardened. It's interesting that after the feeding of the 5,000, 
And then this episode on the boat in the storm on the sea. What Mark chooses to point out to us, and I will use this as really a centerpiece for tonight's study. They still didn't understand about the loaves. About what the loaves that Jesus multiplied in the feeding of the 5,000, they still did not understand completely what it meant. Certainly doesn't include all of them because if you go to other accounts of that episode of Jesus being out on the water during the storm and saving their vessel, they asked what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey his voice. In Luke's Gospel, they say, truly, this was or is the Son of God. Some had been convinced, and still others, their hearts were hardened. It doesn't mean that they were rebelling against God, not that kind of hardness of heart, but, but that they not yet had recognized Jesus for who he was. And certainly, they should have, because that was what the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was all about. And it was only reinforced by Jesus walking out on the water and saving those disciples on that storm-tossed sea. Because the purpose of every single miracle that you find in Scripture is simply this, to solve the problem of people not recognizing Him or receiving Him. And that God was going to accredit Him as indeed who He said He was, the Son of God. God come in the flesh. People weren't going to believe that unless it was shown to them. Amen? It somehow had to be proven to them that he, he was who he said he was. The interesting thing is that many people saw him perform many miracles. In fact, when you get to the end of John's gospel, you find that his closing words at the very end of his gospel was that Jesus performed many more miracles than I've shared with you. And if I were to write them all down, the entire world could not contain all the volumes that would be necessary to tell the story. Jesus performed miracles everywhere he went. I promise you it was more than just 37 miracles. Amen. Perhaps it was 37,000 miracles. But whatever it was, some people saw it and believed and some people saw it and in the hardness and the continuing hardness of their hearts refused to even then to believe that Jesus was a son of God. Fulfilling the Old Testament scripture that says, though seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. What a shame it is that so many people saw the miracles and still refused to believe. Even his own disciples who had already been walking with him for some considerable amount of time when all of this happened, and even when they were saved on that storm-tossed sea, they still did not understand the loaves. The miracle that they had seen Jesus perform that very day of feeding the 5,000. So with all of that being said, I want us to turn to our text. John chapter 6. Where John tells us his version of the feeding of the 5,000. And let me tell you something about this miracle. There was no need for it whatsoever. There was no need for Jesus to perform this miracle. He realized most every miracle he performed, it was in the midst of a crisis. Here was a man who was born blind and he was begging for Jesus to do something for him. And Jesus saw that as a crisis. He wanted that man to see. Here is a centurion whose daughter had just died. And in that moment of crisis, he went and raised her to life again. And by the way, on his way, he was touched at the hem of his garment by a woman who had uncontrollable bleeding. It was a crisis, and Jesus performed the miracle. Every miracle that you see, Jesus was taking care of a crisis. There was no crisis here. 
There was nothing here that just absolutely demanded that Jesus do something like feeding the 5,000 people. In fact, in Matthew and Mark and Luke's gospel accounts of this, of this miracle, what is said is that Jesus was teaching those 5,000 people and all of a sudden the disciples came up with a good idea and said, Lord, why don't we dismiss the crowd? Why don't we tell them to go into the city or into the neighboring villages or to go back to their camp? After all, this was the Passover feast time. There were millions of people that were gathered around Jerusalem who had come to the, observe the Passover feast. And here was this great multitude of people that had gathered around to teach Jesus. And the disciples said, you know, Lord, you've been teaching for quite some time now. I'm sure the crowd's getting hungry. Why don't we just dismiss them? Tell them to come back tomorrow and you'll give them the rest of the sermon. Tell them to go and buy some food and have something to eat. That was a reasonable thing to do, amen. Just send them home. These people weren't about to starve to death. These people weren't, if they didn't eat this very moment, going to just shrivel into nothing and die. They just needed to be dismissed and go, oh, there was no reason for Jesus to perform this miracle. No crisis was being met. No, no demand was being placed upon Jesus to do this, but yet Jesus did it. And as we look into this text, we find out exactly why he did. So John chapter 6 and verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is to the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Now you'll notice what it was that was attracting people to Jesus. What was it? They had seen the miracles, they had seen the signs. What was he doing? He was healing the sick. That really caught the interest of people. People that perhaps they had known personally who had diseases that they thought would never be cured, but Jesus touched them. And Jesus was gaining a great crowd because of the miracles that he was performing. And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. And the Jewish Passover feast was near. And when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And Jesus had no intention of buying them bread. Jesus had no intention of sending them to the local 7-Eleven to see what they could stock up on and bring back to feed the people. You'll notice he said he, he asked this only to test Philip, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. How I many of you know when Jesus has a good idea, it's a good idea. And it's a good idea that has, has a purpose. There is always a, a purpose behind what he does. He already knew what he was going to do, but he was testing Philip. Philip, what, where can we go and buy him some, some food? You'll notice Philip answered him. <laughs> he says eight months' wages would not be enough to buy bread for each one to have even a single bite. Literally in the Greek he said 200 denarii. Even if we had 200 denarii with, you know what a denarii was? One single denarius was a full day's wages. Uh, equivalent in our world today for people that, that weren't wealthy but were just working people. Perhaps we could say it's equal to about 50, 60, 70 dollars a day. It says if you take that for every day for eight entire months and we were to be able to collect all that money, uh, we wouldn't be able to go to the HEB and buy enough. We might even be able to buy out the entire store of all the fish and loaves of bread that it has and perhaps throw in some steaks or some chicken. We could do all sorts of things, but if we did for this number of people, there's absolutely no way it would be enough. All of them would only be able to have a single bite if we had to do it on our own resources. I mean, are you, have you recognized today that when we're in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to depend on our own resources. Amen. We have the greatest resource in all the world. Amen. Amen. 
Uh, Philip didn't understand that yet. Neither did John or Peter or Andrew or any of the other disciples. And so Jesus performed a miracle for a reason so that they could recognize him and truly know who he was. The story goes on. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And he said, here's a boy with small, five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Literally in the Greek it says, but what is that against so many people? Five little loaves. And if you're imagining in your mind a, a loaf of Mrs. Bear's bread, you're looking at the wrong thing. It was more like a biscuit. Small loaves. And two small fish. That's, that's all they had. Brother Mark, I think mm -hmm. the, um, these loaves were made out of barley. So these were, this was very cheap. Bread. Yeah, not even good quality bread, right? No. I mean, this wasn't this wasn't the good stuff. This wasn't those biscuits you get at Red Lobster. Those are good. Oh, those are the best. That's that's not what this was. And Andrew said, "Lord, even with this little meager little bit of bread and fish that we could steal from this boy." It's not nearly nearly enough against such a crowd. By the way, do you know how many people were there? We often talk about the feeding of the 5,000, but you know, Matthew is quite clear about it. He specifies 5,000 men. And then he says, plus women and children. Really, if you look at this reasonably, what, what in light of what Matthew has to say, there were 10... 15,000, maybe 20,000 people who were there. Only 5,000 men. But all these women and children, it was quite the crowd to feed, amen? Quite the crowd to feed. Do you know, do you know what it was that, um, that these disciples were doing? I mean, here was a great opportunity. Their first idea was, Lord, let's send everyone home and let them find something to eat and come back tomorrow with their bellies filled. And there'll be great a great audience tomorrow, but they're probably getting hungry and they're just ready to go. And sometimes when I'm preaching on Sunday morning, I go a little bit long and I have to remind myself, these people are probably getting hungry. It's time to, time to just let them go. And that's what the disciples wanted to do. They saw here as an opportunity, uh, but, but they saw the difficulty in the opportunity. Lord, how great it would be if we did exactly what you told us to do and we would go find them some food and buy them some food and bring it back and spread it out among them. Lord, what a great opportunity that would be. But Lord, we see the difficulty in the opportunity. Do you know the difference between us and Jesus? We often see the difficulty and the opportunity. Jesus sees the opportunity and the difficulty. Amen. It's a great difference. We look at the opportunity and we say, it's oh, just too difficult. And Jesus says, oh, look at this difficulty. What a great opportunity. What a great opportunity to do what? To show the world who I truly am. The sole reason that Jesus performed this miracle, those people didn't need the food. Those people could have gone to the store and bought their own food. They weren't about to die of starvation. Jesus had no reason to give them a single bite to eat. But he had every reason to show himself or who he was. To this, perhaps 20,000 people who had gathered and listened to him, and certainly he had taught them about who he was. And probably he saw the doubt in their eyes. Perhaps he saw that none of them really believed every word he had to say. And so he said, I'm going to take this difficulty and I'm going to use it as an opportunity to show them who I really am. 
And so what happened? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place. By the way, John makes it clear that, that there was plenty of grass in that place. If you ever look at that place where Jesus was on Google Earth, you'll understand one thing. There's not much grass that grows there. But Jesus was in the right place at the right time and it just so happened that where he had gathered these people together there was plenty of grass for people to sit down people didn't want to sit down on the the desert sand or on the rocks after all it was during a time of year in which it was pretty hot it would be like telling you that uh, tomorrow afternoon when it's 105 degrees let's go sit down on the asphalt outside the church no one wants to do that, but you'll sit down on the grass because for some reason the grass stays cool. And here was a cool place for them to sit down. And Jesus said, tell them to sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, John tells us. And the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. And Jesus then took the loaves. How many loaves were there? Five loaves. And he gave thanks and he distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. How many fish were there? Two. I'll just say this as a side note and then I'm going to press on. But five loaves and two fish. Five plus two is what? Seven. Is seven. And seven is the, word, is the number for what? For completeness. For fullness, Jesus took the seven and said, this is all we need. We don't need any more. And then what happened? And when they had had enough to eat, wait a minute. Didn't the disciples say that this was not enough? Even if we went out and spent... 200 denarii, 8 months of wages, everyone would only be able to have one single bite. And when it came to these five loaves and these two fish, and that's nothing to feed this number of people, but everyone had what? Everyone had enough to eat. And he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. God, like my mother used to always tell me when we were growing up, waste not, one not. Jesus said, I don't want any of it to be wasted. And so they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Quite the miracle, wasn't it? Perhaps 20,000 people ate to their fill. They filled their bellies completely on five loaves and two fish that Jesus by his miraculous power multiplied and fed them with. And after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say the wrong thing. It wasn't surely the Son of God stands among us. It certainly this one has come from heaven just as he claimed. But rather, what they said fell quite short of that. Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. You know who they thought he was? They thought that he was Elijah, come down from heaven. They thought he was Jeremiah. They thought he was one of the prophets. That's why Jesus, when he was gathered around his with his disciples at the fireside and they said who do men say that I am well some say that you're Elijah some think that you're Jeremiah and others think you're at least one of the prophets but what was it that Jesus asked Simon Peter but who do you say that I am and he said thou art the son of God why because Peter had understood the message of the miracles and what those miracles indicated but Peter wasn't quick to learn that or understand that but neither was John neither was James they were all a little bit slow to learn 
exactly who Jesus is. Can I confess something to you today? I'm slow to learn who Jesus is. But thank God every day I learn something new. I learn something more about Him. When I'm able to see His wonderful works, when I'm able to hear His marvelous words, when I'm able to live in His wisdom and live according to His ways, and He shows me more and more about Himself every day by being what only he can be, the true and living God. Amen. Well, they fell short. Those great multitude, they, they claimed that he was a prophet, and Jesus so understood that they misunderstood who he was. Then in verse 15, it says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, when we talk about the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, we often end the story right there. Here Jesus saw these people. He recognized that they were certainly getting hungry. He uh, saw the opportunity and the difficulty. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and he fed them, and everybody had their fill. And it was a marvelous day, and that's the end of the story. But let me tell you something. That is not the end of the story. It's only the beginning of the story of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Is as I shared with you from Mark chapter 6 and his version of the story and the episode out on the sea that followed it, it said that even his disciples did not understand the loaves. They failed to completely understand what the message of the loaves really was. And it's not that hungry people need to be fed or thirsty people need to be given something to drink, but the, mir the miracle of the loaves, the message behind it was this, that Jesus truly is the Son of God. That Jesus is the one who had come down from heaven, sent by the Father, and that He alone possessed the very words of life, and that there is no other. And so it's with that understanding that we come to understand the sequel to the story. When all the bellies were filled, Jesus finally dismissed the crowd. Go home, get a good night's sleep, and we'll talk again later. And the crowd left. And Jesus gathered his disciples together and he said to them, he said, go get on a boat over there. He says, I want to spend some time by myself. I don't want you around when I'm just spending some time alone with the Father. I'm going to go up on that mountainside and I'm going to pray and I want you to go ahead and go over on the other side of the sea and tomorrow will be another day. And they probably said, well, Lord, how are you going to join us? Don't worry, I've got my ways. And so he went up on a high mountainside. He watched his disciples depart from the beach and to go across the sea. And he watched him into the late hours of night and suddenly a storm was coming. And Jesus says it's time to, to teach them what they didn't completely understand with the loaves. He knew in his heart, and listen, what he knows in his heart is always true. That they hadn't quite yet understood the meaning of the miracle. And so he let the storm come. Sometimes I, I wonder if this wasn't a storm that he created just for this opportunity or if he just took the opportunity that the storm created. But whatever it was, he saw in verse 18, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. And when they had rowed three or three and a half miles they saw Jesus approaching the boat walking on the water well there's another miracle amen at uh, this time it was a necessary miracle the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 wasn't necessary at all it really makes it an unusual miracle that Jesus wasn't solving a crisis but here was a crisis 
So he came walking out on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. They were willing to take him. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. John leaves out some important things that the other gospel writers bring to the light, such as the episode with Peter. Peter not really believing that was the Lord on the water, and he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come onto the water, and Jesus said, come. And, Jesus, and Peter did until he lost his faith and what happened he began to sink we're not told in this story from John but it's the same story that, that after he had calmed the sea they some of them had recognized him for who he was because of that miraculous sign and said truly truly you are the son of God and John doesn't mention to us here necessarily that there were some who still on that boat of the 12 disciples still didn't believe. I would imagine Judas didn't really believe. If he had, Judas would have never done what he did. Amen. His heart was hardened. He didn't recognize or really receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He was just going along with the, with the ride. And even Jesus walking on the water after feeding 5,000 people just didn't fully convince everybody that Jesus was who he said he was. The one meaning and the one purpose of every miracle that Jesus ever performed. That God was accrediting Jesus to men for who he really was. And so John goes on to say that the next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore. Now he, he takes us back to where the feeding of the 5,000 was. And just to make a long story short here, they came looking for Jesus again. Why were they attracted to him in the first place? In the first place, because they saw how he had healed so many sick people, and now they were coming looking for him again. Why? Because he was the Son of God. No, but because he had fed them with five loaves and two pieces of fish, and it was better and easier to go to Jesus than it was McDonald's. So they went looking for him again. And in verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, and listen to this, because this is where the rubber hits the road, where the hammer hits the head of the nail, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. And certainly Jesus knew they had seen the miraculous sign, but remember what I quoted from the Old Testament earlier. Seeing they do not see. Hearing, but they do not hear. They had seen the miraculous sign, but they had not seen it at a level where they could understand it. To them, the healing of the sick was just that. It was the healing of the sick. That Jesus just had this unique, unusual power to be able to heal sick people. And that Jesus, now they discovered, had this unusual power to fill people's bellies with hardly any food at all. Jesus says, you came not because you saw the signs, because if you had seen the signs, you'd be coming to me for a whole different reason. Not because I stuffed your bellies full of loaves and fish, but because I am the Son of God. And that's what they had failed to see that he was who he said that he was. That he indeed had come from heaven. And that he had come not just to heal sick people and raise dead people and to feed hungry people. Not just so that the blind could see and the deaf could hear and the mute could speak. 
but rather he came to be the savior of the world. He came to be the spotless, stainless lamb of God who takes away the sins of all of us. And that the only way that anyone could ever get to heaven is to trust him for he is the way, the truth, and the life and no one comes to the Father but by him. There was not a single person on this planet that was ever going to believe that message until they came to believe that he was who he said he was. And they weren't going to believe it unless God accredited Jesus to them by the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed. But even the many people who saw it, there were only few who really believed what that message was or even began to comprehend what the message was. It's really a sad statement that John makes here that he quotes Jesus of saying that you came not because you saw the miraculous signs but because of the loaves and you had your fill and he says you haven't seen what really you need to see that I and I alone am God that I and I alone came to be the Savior of the world. And you'll notice that he brings that fact in in verse 27. He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to what? Eternal life. Eternal life. How many of us recognize today that Jesus didn't come here just to make our lives better on earth? I mean, I'm glad he does that. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Amen? But that wasn't the focal part, point of his ministry. It was that we might have eternal life. And here were these men and these women, these boys and these girls that had come all the way across the sea in search of Jesus because they had fed, he had fed them the day before. Now they wanted to be fed again. Jesus looked right through their souls with those radiating eyes that only Jesus has that looks at us like an x-ray machine and sees everything that looks inside of us. He says, you didn't come to me because you believe I'm the Son of God. I was up on that mountainside all day long yesterday teaching you about who I was. And you still don't believe it, but you saw what I could do and it satisfied you because you were hungry. And now you've come only so that you can give, be given something more to eat, but I'm telling you, I'm not going to give it to you. And he didn't. He didn't offer them a thing. He could have. But he didn't. But rather he challenged them to something that was higher and heavier and holier. When he said to them, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. And then you'll notice this verse. And if you don't have this verse underlined in your Bible, you need to. For he says, on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. That's quite the statement, isn't it? And Jesus was saying to them, do you know why I fed you yesterday? Because by me feeding you, I did something that was absolutely impossible according to nature. That I came to do something that was supernatural. So that God could perform that miracle through me and by that he could put his seal of approval on me that what I have said to you and what I have shown you is absolutely true God has stamped his seal of approval upon me reminds me of when Jesus was baptized and when he came out of the water do you remember the voice that came from heaven and said what this is my son in whom I am well pleased Jesus said, you failed to see that. That God, through my healing of the sick and raising of the dead and feeding your empty bellies, is just the Father putting his seal of approval on me. That indeed I have come from him to fulfill his word, to complete his work, and to bring you unto him who someday dying on a cross for you so that you can have bread that lasts forever. Reminds me of what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for loaves of bread or fish from the pond, but who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Jesus was pleading then to them and said, you know, if you'll just come and look for the real thing, I've shown you in illustration what I'm capable of doing. I'm capable of satisfying your hungry stomachs. But oh, if you will only come to me and hunger and thirst not for physical food, but for the spiritual food. Not for the momentary life that you have now, but for the eternal life that you can have. And if you will come to me and hunger not for the loaves and the fish, but for righteousness, what did he say on the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It's interesting what that word is, satisfied. It means continuously satisfied. Never needing anything again. Never longing for anything else again. Because when you have his righteousness, you have all that you need. And then I, I want you to notice just, I'm going to pick out a few verses here in the rest of John chapter 6. In verse 29, Jesus said, The work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. That was after those people that asked him, Well, Lord, what, what work do we need to do to have this eternal life, the eternal life? He says, The only thing that you have to do is what? Is to believe in me. Why did I feed you yesterday? So that you would believe in me. Why did I heal any sick person or raise any dead people? So that you will believe in me. Why yesterday as he looks at his disciples, did I walk out on that water and save you from that storm on the sea? So that you would believe in me. So that you would say the words that you said, truly this is the Son of God. Why did I perform that miracle so that those of you who did not quite believe yet because your hearts were still hard and you did not re recognize me. It was just one step in your development to truly becoming someone who can believe in me. And I promise you this, by the end of his ministry, when he had done everything that he did, they believed. I think of Thomas, you know, the great doubter, who believed when he thought he could, but he doubted more than he believed until that finest and final ministry that Jesus performed when he was raised from the dead and Thomas could touch him and know that he was the living Lord. And then he said, my Lord and my God, he finally believed. Aren't you glad that God is patient with us? <laughs> <laughs> he shows himself to us in so many ways the stars of heaven declare his glory the earth the handiwork of his hands every single thing that we touch and see and smell and hear all coming from the hands of a mighty God. Amen. When I think about this planet upon which we live, had it been hung in space just a few miles closer to the sun, we would all fry. If it were just a little bit further from the sun, we would all freeze. But neither freeze nor fry do I. <laughs> Today I felt like I was going to fry outside. But aren't you glad... That's 105 degrees and not 5,000 degrees. And why does it hang in space exactly where it does uh, so that we neither freeze nor fry, but so that we can know who God really is? The omnipotent, omniscient God of the universe. This universe came into being not just by some big co uh, coincidence of, of events that took place or some Big Bang. Well, I, I tell you, I, I've been asked before if I believe in the Big Bang Theory, and I say I absolutely do. My bang, Big Bang Theory says this, God spoke the word and bang, there it was. Amen. All of it perfectly. Amen. 
It's one of the signs, one of the wonders that you can't help but look at it and know that God is exactly who he says he is. And definitely that God is, period. Amen? Amen. Why? Because of the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And so it was with the Lord Jesus. Performing a miracle there was no necessity to perform. No reason whatsoever. The disciples were absolutely right. Lord, let's just send them home so that they can have something to eat. Easy enough. There was no crisis. But Jesus performed the miracle for the reason he performed every single miracle he performed that the world might know he had indeed come from heaven sent by the Father and that he and he alone had the words of eternal life and that no one comes to the Father except through him who is the way the truth and the life there is no other amen and yet so many who had seen it still didn't recognize him. Still didn't receive him. There are lots of mysteries in this world that I don't fully understand, but I think that's the greatest of them all. How 2,000 years ago, so many people had seen so many miracles that Jesus performed. And like Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night and said, Lord, I know that you have come from God for no one can do the things that you do unless God were with him. And yet so many people recognizing how utterly unusual and unique this was that Jesus performed all these things that nobody else could do. But even still, seeing they really didn't see. And hearing they still didn't hear. I don't understand. I don't understand how people today can not look at this marvelous universe in which we live and not fall on their knees and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But I'm glad that you have. And I'm glad that God gave me the opportunity to do that. And I'm so glad that um, Jesus performed miracles so that we can hear the wonderful testimonies given by Scripture. I'm going to close with this. There was a certain element within the crowd that not only had they failed to believe, but they had become absolutely stubborn against the message that they witnessed in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. When, verse 41, at this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? They saw it. They saw the miraculous signs. They had seen the healing of so many. They had seen the feeding of the 5,000. They had heard the testimony of Jesus walking out on the water and saving the disciples in the storm. They said, this is no more than just the son of Joseph. This man who had come to that dirty town of Nazareth out of which nothing good could ever come. And how can, can he say that I am the, he the bread that's come down from heaven? And Jesus just simply said, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up in the last days. Those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ refuse to accept the drawing of the Holy Spirit and the mercy of God. You know, I, I don't believe that Jesus 
or God just draws certain people. I believe he's invited everyone. That's why Jesus, when he spoke to his disciples about his death, he said, if I be lifted up, and he was talking about his death on the cross, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Aren't you glad that God loves everybody? Amen. For God so loved the entire world that he gave his one and only son. There are those who hear and see and they believe and they accept. There are those who hear and see and yet they just, for whatever mysterious reason, reject it altogether and refuse to eat the bread that's come down from heaven. They'll hold out their hands and accept the bread of earth from God, but not that which comes from heaven. So I hope that you I've gotten something out of this tonight. I, 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 I don't know, but, but, I, but I just want to reinforce this. Jesus didn't feed the 5,000 because people were hungry or because he wanted them to eat. But for the reason he performed every other miracle, he might be accredited unto them to be exactly who he said he was, the Son of God. Maybe there's something along the way I haven't stopped to let you interject, but I want to do that for just a few moments. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share about this miracle? I can only imagine the conversations that were being held, you know, when, when he did perform such a miracle. I just, what I'd like to do when I, when I read the Bible, I try to like put myself in, in that same, like what, what was that like, or, you know, depending on the scene, what was the fragrance like, what what were the face expressions and reactions um, that maybe, you know, just led people's, uh, because we can influence one another, right? Um, but like you said, they, they didn't understand. Um, and I, I think you can look at it like with churches when they have, uh, example fellowships you know some people really are there for the fellowship or you know if we invite someone outside from the church or even even members at some point it could happen where they're just like well there's going to be cake you know are you really there for the message right. you know is your heart in the right place um and so just something that came to mind to like the, the modern day you know one thing that, that struck me as I was thinking about this parable last night is um, if you, uh, this miracle, if, if, if you were to ask people, tell us some of the happiest stories in the Gospels, people would mention this one. Oh, when Jesus fed the 5,000 and all the people were so happy. And they'll look at that and say, well, that's one of the happiest stories in all the Bible. Can I tell you something? There's nothing happy about it. It's one of the saddest, most tragic things that happened in the ministry of Jesus. Perhaps 20,000 people and Jesus, Irby, can you imagine you standing up and preaching a sermon that God has laid on your heart and is like a fire burning within you and you preach that sermon and you know you've got one message and one message only that you're going to communicate to everyone that they all need to hear. And then you realize that when you're all done, not one single person heard that in the message. As clearly as it was preached, they just heard something different. And not one single person caught what you preached. It's exactly what happened with 20,000 people who Jesus preached a message through his miracle and not one person caught it. Not even his own disciples. So much so he had to reinforce it by walking out on the water so that maybe someone on that boat would get it. But what Mark's gospel is true, they didn't understand the loaves. I hope we understand the loaves a little bit better tonight. Pastor, I saw your your mind churning. What what you got for us? Oh no, I just I love the study. Uh, you know, uh, like you said, you know, the, the, uh, and and I, I really want to reinforce that if if uh, if our church gets anything from this series on the miracles, it's like what what I said and what you reinforced tonight. 
the purpose of the miracles was so that he could evidence that he was who he said he was, that he was the son of God, and that people would come to faith in that. And here is a tragedy, because if that's the purpose of the, the miracle, uh, each miracle had its message, and the message here, it's not a coincidence that Jesus feeds the multitude with just a few loaves of bread, thousands and thousands, and then immediately calls himself the bread of life. I mean, that's 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 the parallel. That's the message behind the miracle that that uh, he, these people come back and they're they're hungry again, and Jesus is declaring himself uh, the bread that I offer. I have a bread that 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 surpasses anything. What do they say, sir? Give us this bread, which parallels what the the Samaritan woman says whenever he talks about the the, the living water. Sir, give me this living water. Now the woman gets it because he he says, woman, I'm telling you that. He, he who you're looking for, that's me. I'm, I'm the Messiah. And she believes she goes to her town and she shares that message and becomes the first uh, minister, uh, uh, missionary to to her, her, her to the Samaritans. But the uh, the message here is missed. You're right. It's it's not a happy story. It's a tragedy that these people that came and it reflects the church and kind of like what Veronica said. How how many people come to church? And I was just turning on this. How many people come to church? And they don't know what they're looking for. They're looking for an immediate need. Mm -hmm. They're coming because they're hungry for something. They have a they have a problem in their marriage. They, they can't find a job. They need financial help. They come for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And all the while, they're coming for that piece of bread, that piece of fish, mm -hmm. not knowing that the giver of those things is much greater than any problem that they could have. And it's tragic. And, and I think the reason I was just sitting here like this is because it's frustrating. It's got to be for you too. You've been a minister for so long, and I sometimes wonder, Lord, what am I doing wrong? Like, what, what, you know, what else can I do? I, you, you can't shake them. You, you know, you, you can't scream. And you can all you can do is just share the gospel and, and do the best and say, Lord, send your Spirit that it may, you know, it, it may uh, uh, convict these people. And I love the group that we have. But we all want it to grow. We all want others to come to conviction. And, and I think that it, it, it must have pained Jesus to, to see that. Because I know it pains me. It pains me to see people, whether it's here at this church and other churches. And the sad thing, Mark, I think, is that so many of the modern churches, they just accommodated to that. You want, you want to be entertained? Fine. We'll just entertain you. You want to just be motivated? Fine. I won't preach the gospel. I'll just bring a motivational speech. The, the, the church is accommodated to that desire rather than the other way around. And I wonder how many churches are, are faithfully bringing Jesus as the bread of life rather than the temporary bread that the people seek. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And you want, you want to hear how John verbalizes the tragedy at the end of chapter 6? And Jesus turned the attention away from the earthly loaves and turned their attention to the eternal bread that he had come to give them. What finally happened is John, get this, 666. 666, I guess, has some significance, I guess. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed. That's how much they missed the message of the miracle. You know, uh, can I say something? Yeah, sure. That, uh, that got me attention is that uh, verse 27 that God had the power of Christ and given his seal that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. he gives our approval and God eyes you with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> Only if you really understood with all your heart mm -hmm. and give yourself to Christ. Yep. That is you, your mind. Yep. Brother, I couldn't wow. hear the last thing you said. Can you repeat that one more time? I could barely hear it. Huh? The last sentence you said, can you repeat that? I, I couldn't hear it. I didn't hear you very well. Oh, yeah, I couldn't hear you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, what I'm saying is that what it got my attention, mm -hmm. verse 27, 
verse 27, mm -hmm. when God gave the proof to his son, Jesus Christ, and gave it his seal, that when we Christian believe mm -hmm. in our heart, truly believe, and accept Christ, our Lord and Savior, he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The approval. We got the approval of God with the Holy Spirit. To have eternal life in Christ. Thank you. Yes, we have a question from Facebook. And the question is it says, Can we say that Mary encouraged Christ to feed the 5,000 men as a mother should encourage their children? That's a question. Can we say that Mary encouraged Christ to feed? Um, well, where was Mary in this situation? I'm just, oh, I'm just you, I, do you think that? As Mary encouraged him to turn water into wine, did she have an influence here? There, there's no evidence that Mary was even there, and she probably wasn't. Jesus had been quite some time on the road. I don't think he took Mama along with him. She wasn't there. She wasn't following everywhere. So, so I, I would, I would think not. And Jesus, Jesus didn't live under the influence of his mother, even when Jesus. Uh, was asked by her to, you know, she dropped a pretty heavy hint, they run out of wine, and he didn't say mother, he said what? He said woman. woman. Right? He was saying there's a different relationship between me and you now than what we shared growing up, and I'm not going to obey you. Right, right. I'm going to only obey my father. And even through, through the Bible, when we study it, really, none of his family, brother and sister, sister and her mother, they didn't understand until really Jesus died and rose again. That's when they believed. Yeah. Other than that, they don't, they don't believe it. They don't follow him. They was making a joke about it. Oh, go, go and do this. Hey, you say do this? Go and do that so they can believe you. You know, just mocking him all the time. Circle this in your mind in Mark chapter 6 where those disciples on the boat who still didn't believe even after Jesus saved them, what did Mark point out? They still didn't understand the loaves. Understand the loaves, amen? Amen. I hope amen. that tonight we understand amen. the loaves a little bit better. So, Ernie, you amen. want to dismiss us? Absolutely. Oh, thank you, brother. That was a, was that's a great study. Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. You know, um, yeah, I was doing a lot of thinking uh, as a as a pastor, and I'm sure you you've had plenty of those thoughts in your ministry. Lord, how can I be more effective in in sharing the gospel? Wow. You know, um, but as they rejected Jesus, uh, you know, ministry comes with rejection. The Christian walk comes with reject rejection, yes. and we need to and and that's the truth. Uh, if, if we think we're going to be uh, popular accepted and so if that's the motivation we're in the wrong business, the wrong business. yeah the, so we we need to understand that as a community yes we have encouragement we love one another but according to the world we, we don't belong and um you know what i see here brother i see here jesus trying to make a point here which you so well taught here he's doing something supernatural so that they can know that he is supernatural and in doing so He's offering them a permanent solution to their life and to look beyond the temporal need. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, I think that this world is so caught up in its temporal desires. What I want now, uh, the, the immediate satisfaction of the flesh. And so um, as we close here in prayer, um, we um, I think this is something that, that really needs to be meditated on. And uh, Mark gave us a lot of great uh, tools here to think about but I think that's the main thing what we deal in a uh, deal in our permanent solutions and we don't look to the to the temporal things yes we're gonna suffer for a while yes we're gonna have trials and tribulations but that's why we smile in the midst of those things because we have a permanent fix to this temporal life does that make sense we have a permanent solution to this temporal life and those people who do not know Jesus do not understand that and um, I think that this this miracle says it very well. So, brother, thank you. Thanks again for bringing this message. And uh, uh, with that being said, let's close in prayer. And uh, uh, hopefully, we'll all beat this a storm that's on its way over here. 
Lord Father, I thank you, Lord, for the rain that is to come. I thank you for the blessings that you send, uh, send us every day. Lord, I thank you for the message of this miracle. That through this wonderful act, Jesus declaring himself sealed under your approval to be the bread of life, the bread of heaven. And Lord, that he offered himself to those who were willing to receive him and how unfortunate it is that so many focused only on their temporal desires and needs, their momentary hunger could, could not see past the momentary bread. Lord, I pray that through this, that we as believers, that we can look in our life and look beyond the temporal the temporal needs and know that there's something much greater and much bigger beyond the things that we deal with and we uh, thank you Lord because we have our, our hope and our rest lies in Jesus as the bread of heaven he feeds us and boy are we satisfied boy are we filled boy do we have joy and contentment and lord father i thank you i thank you for for sending us your son who fills all things and that we may be able to share the bread of life with others lord thank you for for this great uh, study and i thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here may you bless us on on our way home and bless us the rest of the week until we gather again i thank you in jesus mighty name amen